Hello and welcome to Not at the Museum Thursday night. I'm Sylvia. I'm the assistant curator here at the Niagara Falls History Museum. As usual, we begin our night with a land acknowledgement. The region of Niagara of Ontario is located in the traditional shared territory of the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and Chinatan people. The Chinatan people have called this land their home for thousands of years, and more recently, the Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee have been sharing the land as one dish, one spoon treaty territory. Tonight, we are starting our imbibe talks, exploring the history of alcohol, drinks, and drinking. Our first speaker is Jesse Abbott. He is a PhD candidate in Canadian history at the University of Waterloo. He studies a variety of topics in pre-Confederation period, including masculinity, race, and alcohol. So tonight he will be discussing gentlemen connoisseurs and fine wine. You'll notice at the bottom of your screen, uh, there is a Q&A feature on Zoom. So if you have any questions for Jesse throughout this presentation, feel free to write him a question. And at the end, he will also uh, answer that question. So grab your libations and your drink of choice. And Jesse, take it away. Could, couldn't have said it any better myself. Thank you very much for having me. Um, thank you to the Battleground Museum for having me and for everyone for attending. Much of this presentation tonight is taken from chapter two of my PhD dissertation. I'm currently in the process of completing at the University of Waterloo and hope to have finished early next year. Um, today, as mentioned, we are going to discuss late 18th and early 19th century gentlemen and their drinking habits. So I do hope that everyone has a glass of wine with them. Um, but naturally, the first question to answer is, what is a gentleman? So we'll get into it. Gentlemanliness in this period was both an indicator of class status and it carried masculine connotations. It signified wealth and status, but also a certain masculine deportment. To be thought of as a gentleman in British society in the late 18th and early 19th century, a man typically needed sufficient land holdings, wealth, or aristocratic family ties. The aristocracy, nobility, and gentry were full of gentlemen by birth. But gentlemen were also distinguished by the way in which they carried and conducted themselves, by their capacity for gentlemanly social performance. They were expected to be civil, genteel, and conform to the dictates of politeness. Polite gentlemen practiced good manners, were restrained in their emotional expression and indulgence in vice, and sought to settle disputes with discussion rather than violence. Their tastes were sophisticated and their dress elegant. They saw themselves as models of civility. Gentlemen sought to engage in polite conversation to win the affection of ladies, accompany them to balls and show off their skills in dancing. Accordingly, aspiring gentlemen and, and gentlemen officers who my research focuses on, um, mingled with high society, they courted ladies, attended balls and dances, and of course, drank fine wine. They sought to prove themselves as particularly gentlemanly by their polite performances in this regard. Uh, even in the relative backwater of Upper Canada and during the cold winter months, they strove to live and socialize according to established masculine norms for men of their social station. Lavish spending habits, particularly the consumption of high quality port and Madeira wine, played an important role in constructing their gentlemanly identity in the public eye. Behind closed doors and after hours, bouts of heavy drinking also tested their manhood in the eyes of their peers, other gentlemen. In this sense, alcohol was, to quote my former supervisor, Renee Lafferty, a tool which a man could use to demonstrate his manhood, as well as a tool which could strip him of the same. Drunkenness was the behavior of the effeminate and weak, but the man who could hold his liquor was admired and even lionized. Not all gentlemen were created equal, and in social situations, a gentleman was often defined by the company he kept. This is revealed by comments from William Tiger Dunlop. At the time, he was an assistant surgeon in the 89th Regiment, and afterwards a prominent figure in Upper Canadian history. But prior to shipping out to the Canadas, he complained of the quality of gentlemen officers stationed at the Army Depot on the Isle of Wight. And I quote, 
I went once and only once to the garrison mess in company with two or three officers of my acquaintance and saw, among other novelties of a mess table, one officer shy a leg of mutton at another's head from one end of the table to the other. This we took as a notice to quit, so we made our retreat in good order and never again returned or associated with a set of gentlemen who had such a vivacious mode of expressing a difference of opinion. As Dunlop's comments indicate, some gentlemen officers, many of whom he notes were bound for service in the Canadas, were less than John Teal. Dunlop feared that his own reputation or image would suffer if caught conversing or dining with such men, and he hoped for better company upon shipping out. But upon arrival in Upper Canada, he found few proper gentlemen or ladies to socialize with. Canadian or colonial born gentlemen with whom British officers mingled during the war of 1812 were often cast as the social inferiors of their counterparts in Europe. It was thought that they did not have access to the same kind of upbringing, education and lifestyle as their counterparts. Affluent Canadian families did indeed have difficulty accessing the requisite supplies to keep up an adequately respectable household replete with refined niceties and polite servants. And British-born officers similar struggled when stationed here, uh, often sending home for various items. Moreover, it was thought that colonial gentlemen lacked the same capacity for polite socialization. Their manners weren't as refined, their dress not as fashionable. John Howison, a Scottish doctor who traveled to the Canadas in 1818, commented that Upper Canadian society was favorable to the existence of general harmony and goodwill, but rather hostile to the cultivation and advancement of manners. For example, Howison was quite taken by the beauty of Canadian ladies, noting that some are extremely pretty with beautifully dark and sparkling eyes, but also remarked upon the naivete of their manners. Lieutenant John Le Couture, speaking of New York immediately following the war, similarly noted that the parties there were filled with well-dressed women whose style was an attempt at French, but a gauche imitation of it. The girls were not well got up. He noted that the dinners were very handsome, good, profuse, but hurried over, not the English social meal. Dunlop similarly looked down on some of the species of the genus gentlemen, which he encountered on this side of the herring pond. He recalled one afternoon when he and a friend, the Colonel, were interrupted in the pleasant occupation of discussing his wine and listening to my agreeable conversation by a Yankee gentleman dressed in a blue something that might have been a cross between a surtout or a great coat who wore his hat in the parlor and spit on the carpet. This encounter led Dunlop to remark that the word gentleman on this side of the Atlantic conveys no idea of either high birth or high breeding, nor even a clean shirt or a whole coat. While there certainly was a perceived difference between colonial gentlemen and their highborn or homebarn cart counterparts, these divisions did not always exist in reality. British-born gentlemen and gentlemen officers were not all members of the gentry. They did not necessarily have good manners or proper upbringings. And likewise, colonial gentlemen were not all crude and uneducated or without financial means. Take William Hamilton Merritt, for example who served as a lieutenant and later a captain in the first Niagara Light Dragoons of the Lincoln Militia. His parents were landholders. He was educated in mathematics and classics prior to the war, and he served as a Dragoon officer, which was a much more socially elite unit, largely because you had to provide your own horse. Uh, following the Battle of Lundy's Lane, when Merritt was imprisoned with several other regular officers in New York State, he was treated furthermore as any other British gentleman officer, frequently dining with men like Captain Gore of the 89th, whom Merritt described as very gentlemanly, active, and handsome. Dunlop similarly saw no issue in socializing with the local gentleman he encountered in the then insignificant village of Cornwall. And that's a quote. He noted that when in town, they came to our mess, and when they had imbibed a sufficient quantity of port, they regaled us with toughish yarns of their military doings during the Revolutionary War. And when a tea drinking party called a sufficient number of the aristocracy together, an extemporaneous dance was got up, a muffled drum and fife furnishing the orchestra. These old officers, despite their origins, still displayed a proper gentlemanly penchant for drinking, conversing, and dancing. Speaking of which, gentlemen officers stationed in the Canadas 
frequently attended social engagements like dances, balls, and concerts. There they could practice their refined manners, court ladies, and show off their skill in dancing. Events and attendance at these events were very formal, polite, and genteel as possible. Longtime staff officer James Green described the type of socializing that mili military gentlemen like himself got up to in Quebec in 1810. We have had nothing but feasting and dancing and the like. General Brock gave a dinner to the governors today and a ball to as many ladies as his room could conveniently contain. They danced in two rooms to the band of the 8th Regiment, which is unquestionably the best military band I ever saw, both in point of numbers and fine execution on their instruments. Captain Selby of the Owen Glendover gave a superb déjeuner on his ship the day before, which was conducted in superior style. Today, the races begin. Dinner at the Bishop's, play in the evening, tomorrow races, dinner at the Chateau to a number of ladies and gentlemen, and a race ball at the hotel in the evening. Large gatherings like balls were commonly held to celebrate victories, commemorate holidays or anniversaries, or to mark special occasions. Smaller dinners and dances were organized more regularly, and private groups often met several times a month. Gatherings were less frequent, of course, during the lean years of the war, but they continued nonetheless. And by the winter of 1814-1815, with the war coming to a close, the social scene was thriving once again. Lecouture noted that at an assembly in February of 1815, it was the most crowded I ever saw, could only manage two dances out of spirits. The ball in particular was an important social ritual in 18th century military life and its core activity, dancing, fostered the culture of polite masculinity. Now, it was during the winter months in the Canadas that gentlemen got their best opportunity to show off these skills in dancing. Howison noted that when the snow is on the ground, a social intercourse takes place among its inhabitants. A great deal of visiting goes on and balls, picnics, and card parties frequently occur. Sleigh rides, skating, and tobogganing were also very popular activities, especially for gentlemen seeking to court a lady. Gentlemen and gentlemen officers strove to live according to their station throughout the winter months, despite limitations imposed by the weather. Dunlop, for example, describes passing the winter of 1813-1814 in a blacksmith shop near Kingston with a fellow junior lieutenant. There, they managed to keep themselves tolerably comfortable during an unusually rigorous winter, he notes. They were often visited by friends coming or going who partook with great gout of our frozen beef, who had to be, which had to be cut into steaks with a handsaw. Being on the banks of a fine stream, we were never at a loss for ducks, and in the surrounding pine woods, the partridges were abundant, and the Indians brought us venison in exchange for rum so that we had at least a plentiful, if not elegant table, and we were enabled to pass the winter nights as pleasantly over our rum ration as I ever did, in a place with much more splendid appliances and means to boot. We passed the remainder of the winter as officers are obliged to do in country quarters. We shot, we lounged, we walked, and did all the flirtation that a neighborhood of a mill, a shop, a tavern, with two farmhouses within a reasonable forenoon's walk could afford. We were deprived, however, of the luxury of spinning over a bridge, which Dr. Johnston says is the principal amusement of officers in country quarters. For though we had a bridge close at hand, the stream beneath it was frozen. Merritt, similarly, spent the winter as pleasantly as possible, often having a dance at Shipman's and at my father's, attending card parties and the like. Apparently, the poor weather did little to deter local ladies from joining in the winter festivities either. Lecouture noted that on the night of the 3rd, January 1815, the heavy rain seemed likely to spoil the chance of a good assembly this evening, but the ladies of Kingston like small difficulties to show their spirit in surmounting them. Lecouture attended a number of social events in Kingston and Montreal that winter, well on garrison duty there. In addition to Kingston and Montreal, a number of other places where there was a thriving social scene, uh, Newark appears to have been a popular locale prior to the war. There are numerous accounts of dinners and balls held at Robert Hamilton's and at other members of Canadian high society in Queenston during the preceding years. After hearing of one splendid ball hosted by General Isaac Brock in 1811, uh, which featured apparently the Beaumont of Niagara, of Niagara and its vicinity, 
Colonel James Kemp wrote to his friend the general to complain that we have no such parties now, and the indisposition of Sir James having prevented the usual public days at the castle, nothing more stupid than Quebec now as can be imagined. Although this may have been the case prior to the war, most of the social scene during and immediately following the war actually appears to have been centered in Lower Canada, specifically Montreal. This is perhaps unsurprising, given that most of the fighting during the course of the war and destruction of property took place in Upper Canada, especially in the Niagara and York regions. John Duncan's comments from his 1818 to 1819 travels through Upper Canada highlight the lack of amenities for travelers. He noted that, except the Navy Yard and the fortifications, which I had not time to visit, there is little to detain a traveler at Kingston. However, he noted, after the dullness of Niagara and York, there is an air of life and activity about it, which makes one feel as if he was getting into the world again. He was on his way to Montreal, which both he and Le Couture spoke very highly of. In March of 1815, Le Couture remarked that Montreal is the most agreeable quarter. I am very comfortable and in tolerable health introduced to the genteelest circles. Sir John and Lady Johnson, the Richardsons, Forsyths, Grants, Caldwells, Judge Ogdens and Foucher, French Roman Catholics, among whom I found all sorts of entertainments, balls, dinners, and country parties. Unlike many British officers, Le Couture spoke French very well and quickly ingratiated himself with various members of the local French Canadian gentry. He recalled in later life that it was a delightful sojour for a soldier, that city of Montreal. Le Couture enjoyed himself there, possibly even more than he did in Fredericton, which is saying something. That's where he was first stationed upon his arrival in North America. In December of 1812, he wrote that some idea may be entertained of the society at Fre Fredericton, but I relate that I was at 35 dinners, evening partings, or balls since I came here on the 4th of September. So over 35 parties between September and December. Interestingly enough, quite a bit of gentlemanly socializing on the part of officers also took place south of the border, both during and immediately following the war. Uh, Le Couture attended a number of social events in New York on his way to his next, next posting following the war. He was on his way to the West Indies. And Merritt's journal reveals that he attended and even hosted a number of balls and concerts while a prisoner of war in New York State. He was frequently mingling with local ladies from Pittsfield and Pittsford, much to the chagrin of the local men. Gentlemen officers seemingly looked for any opportunity to socialize with other gentlemen and especially the ladies. Gentlemen, however, typically outnumbered ladies at these events, particularly military events. Le Couture recalled a party in December of 1814 at which 24 ladies and 100 gentlemen were in attendance, which led him to exclaim, girls up, market high. Clearly, he was used to parties with even fewer women. Indeed, when the men were on campaign, finding proper ladies to socialize with would have been quite difficult. When none were available, and even sometimes when they were, it was not uncommon for thin, handsome young men like Le Couture to dress in drag for dances or balls. Uh, a masquerade ball and supper given by the Marquis of Tweeddale in Montreal in March of 1815 saw Le Couture in drag and being asked to dance by several men. What a delightful ball, he recalled. We had 700 persons from the devil to his darling. My rather saucy manner tickled the men amazingly. Several asked me to dance two or three times. He did such a good job that afterwards, when plays were held at the garrison, he, of course, was forced to play the role of the heroine, something which he did not enjoy. Merritt similarly noted that at their Saturday night concerts and balls, again, while a prisoner in, in the U.S., Lieutenant Spillsberries and Humphreys take the part of the ladies. This was not seen as effeminate, I, I have to note, and indeed it did not impact Humphrey's status in particular as, and I quote, a perfect ladies' man. In addition to dancing and the presence of ladies, alcohol was of course a staple at these events and a key component of gentlemanly socialization. The consumption of fine wines in particular could confer upon one a sort of gentlemanly status. 
it was a primary feature of many dinners and balls in the Canadas, including a celebration of the Queen's birthday in York in 1809, as reported in the York Gazette. And I quote, an elegant ball and supper was given at the government house. Dancing commenced at 10 o'clock, the ballroom having been tastefully and elegantly fitted up and decorated for the occasion. At half past one, the supper room was thrown open when the company, amounting to about 100 persons, partook of a very sumptuous banquet consisting of every delicacy and a variety of the choicest wines. Dancing was resumed after supper and kept up with great spirit till near eight o'clock in the morning when the company retired highly gratified with the splendor of the entertainment. Wine would both accompany dinner and be served afterwards well into the night. Merritt recalled several carousals, in fact, which carried on till two or three o'clock, and of course the aforementioned eight o'clock in the morning. Consequently, quite a bit of wine was usually consumed. Um, actual quantities can be difficult to ascertain, but we do have some evidence from a party held by Peter Russell to celebrate the King's birthday in 1798. The service included at least 70 bottles of wine, three bottles of brandy, and 10 bottles of porter, along with seven pounds of sugar for, sang they call it sinagree, but sangria, um, and given the number of meals served, there appears to have been 52 people in attendance. This likely included some women who did not partake as heavily. Um, so we can estimate roughly one to two bottles per man in that sitting. A private group of subscribed assembly goers at York in 1814 drank a similar amount. Uh, in the span of three months, this is from January to March 1814, and we have the records, across five meetings, they accumulated a tab of, and I should mention there's roughly 31 attendants, they drank through 38 gallons of wine in Madeira. I did do a bit of math, but again, this is roughly one to two bottles per man per sitting. And this is, of course, an average. Some likely drank less, while others certainly drank more. Um, according to some secondary sources, much, much more. All of Jones and Ann Smith note that at one party in Halifax, 20 diners drank 63 bottles of wine in a sitting. So taken all together, I would say that the three bottle man moniker, which was popularized during this period, which denoted a particularly manly tolerance for alcohol, seems to have been relatively accurate. These types of subscription dinner parties were commonly attended by gentlemen in socially elite circles, and they mimicked in many ways gatherings in the officer's mess. Uh, for example, in York in August of 1811, a Mrs. Powell noted that 15 gentlemen subscribe and with their families meet and dine at a pretty house about two miles from town, once a fortnight. After dinner, the fife and drum induced the young folks to dance, and we return home in the evening in good humor with one another. Each subscriber takes his cold dish and a bottle of wine and a moderate rent is paid for the house. At the larger aforementioned York assemblies in 1814, subscribers paid $10 each uh, for similar fare. They got this, uh, this got them, I should say, access to a substantial amount of wine in Madeira, as mentioned, but also live music, uh, playing cards, freshly baked cakes, milk, sugar. There was a large amount of Heisen tea consumed, it's a Chinese tea. Um, a superintendent was given to the party, female attendants, and Charles, a black man for waiting. That is something that was on the um, subscription list that was paid for. At both these private dinners and in the officer's mess, we see that hierarchies of gender, class, and race were reinforced privileged, gentlemanly, and white masculine identities were forged, but these hierarchies were reinforced at the same time. John Howison remarked that in a society without an aristocracy like the Canada's, no man can assume a higher station in society than another, except upon the score of superior intellect or greater wealth the latter of which is, of course, rather often recognized as a ground of distinction than the former. Lavish spending habits and conspicuous consumptions of items like the choicest wines signaled that a consumer had wealth and thus they conferred a degree of gentlemanly status. Economist Thorstein Veblen describes this process as conspicuous consumption. 
the acquisition and consumption of luxury goods as a means by which members of the leisure class demonstrated wealth and denoted social superiority. Veblen explains that the gentleman of leisure not only consumes of the staff of life beyond the minimum required for subsistence and physical efficiency, but his consumption also undergoes a specialization as regards to the quality of goods consumed. The consumption of these more excellent goods is evidence of wealth. It becomes honorific. And conversely, the failure to consume in due quantity and quality becomes a mark of inferiority and demerit. This growth of punctilious discrimination as to a qualitative excellence in eating, drinking, and the like presently affects not only the manner of life, but also the training and intellectual activity of the gentleman. He is no longer simply the successful, aggressive male, the man of strength, resource, and intrepidity. In order to avoid stultification, he must also cultivate his taste, for it now becomes incumbent upon him to discriminate with some nicety between the noble and ignoble and consumable goods. He becomes a connoisseur in creditable viands of various degrees of merit in manly beverages and trinkets. In Veblen's view, this type of conspicuous behavior also extended to army officers, for he saw the profession of arms as one of these leisure class occupations. Basically, they didn't produce anything to, uh, or directly contribute to the economy. That's what he defined as a leisure class occupation. And gentlemen officers during this period did indeed construct their gentlemanly masculinity through conspicuous consumption, specifically the consumption of fine wines. Pictured here are some of their lovely, elegant traveling cases that they would carry around for spirits and wine. As noted, what a gentleman drank, their choice in alcohol, played an important role in masculine socialization and identity construction. James Boswell, biographer of the infamous 18th century gentleman Samuel Johnson, explained that Johnson spoke with great contempt of claret, that's a clear red wine from Bordeaux as so weak that a man would be drowned by it before he made him drunk. Poor stuff, he said. No, sir, claret is the liquor for boys, port for men, but he who aspires to be a hero, smiling, must drink brandy. In the first place, the flavor of brandy is most grateful to the palate, and then brandy will do soonest for a man what drinking can do for him. There are indeed few who are able to drink brandy. Johnson's comments reveal that the consumption of these liquors carried certain masculine connotations. For example, any association with France, French claret, could be construed as effeminate or weak. Consuming weak claret in this context would make the imbiber similarly weak or effeminate. Strong men drank strong drinks, and port, it's roughly 18 to 20 percent alcohol was stronger than claret it's roughly 10 to 14 percent alcohol and very light in color and brandy of course was stronger still roughly 35 to 40 percent alcohol and often even higher uh, thus being able to consume large amounts of expensive brandy in british high society in this period demonstrated not only national loyalty refinement and privilege but also manly strength as i take a sip of my port In the Canadas, the selection of alcohol that gentlemen officers had access to was more limited than in Britain or Europe. There are a few references, for example, to officers drinking, there are few references, I should say, to officers drinking brandy. Claret, on the other hand, seems to have been fairly popular. Captain Langslau recalled dining in the mess of the 70th Regiment in Niagara in 1817, which featured port and claret in profusion. But more so than claret, port wine and closely related, uh, related Madeira wine were definitely the favorites of gentlemen and gentlemen officers in the Canadas. Both are fortified wines that are still produced in Portugal in the, uh, I'm going to mispronounce this, but Douro Valley in the north and on the Madeira Islands off the northwest coast of Africa, respectively. The Spanish fortified wine sherry was also popular, although definitely not to the same extent. Uh, producers in the early 18th century had begun fortifying wines with brandy prior to, prior to shipping to prevent spoilage, but by the end of the 18th century, they were adding branding during fermentation to produce a stronger and often sweeter effect. 
This desirable strength and taste, as well as strong political ties with Portugal, led to port wine being a the most popular wine amongst all wine drinking classes in Britain by the end of the 18th century and into the 19th. Like port, Madeira wine similarly rose in popularity during this period and in price, reflecting its luxury status. Rod Phillips notes that the price of Madeira on the London, Kingston, and Boston markets tripled between 1780 to 1880. Both wines became particularly popular in North America, which is perhaps unsurprising given their superior shelf life. A bill from the managers of the York Assemblies in the early months of 1814 gives us an idea of what people were drinking in the capital of Upper Canada. The assembly consumed over six gallons of Tenerife, that's Spanish wine in Madeira, over 25 gallons of London market Madeira, and six gallons of various unspecified wines, all purchased at varying prices. So clearly Madeira was popular and the quality or terroir of all of these wines mattered. Gentlemen officers' tastes largely mirrored their civilian counterparts in this regard, with the exception of officers continuing to indulge in claret. Um, both Dunlop and especially Le Couture certainly enjoyed a glass of claret, Madeira, or port wine in polite company, and there is evidence of some brandy, porter, or punch when the occasion called for it. As noted, conspicuously consuming gentlemen officers not only chose their variety of wine carefully, they also had an eye for quality. True connoisseurs procured the oldest and rarest vintages in an effort to set themselves apart. For example, at a ball in 1807, described in a June 13th letter of the Upper Canada Gazette, everything rare and good was there, and good champagne and burgundy. Philip notes that from, Phillips, I should say, notes that from 1780, producers marketed older wines, more than 10 years old, as especially suitable for intelligent consumers. The older the wine, the more distinguished its drinker. Unlike soldiers who typically purchased alcohol in small quantities and consumed it immediately, officers often purchased in large quantities and stored bottles away for long periods of time. Lukatur noted that the officer's mess of the 104th in Fredericton, for example, featured wines as old as in a private cellar, and Brock himself was said to have had 566 bottles of port in his private collection at the time of his death. Consuming these luxurious and distinguished wines conferred gentlemanly status upon those officers and elevated them as models of polite privileged masculinity. Dunlop, for example, lauded praise on one particular regiment of artillery and another of sharpshooters, both formed of the gentlemen of Montreal for their conspicuous consumption in the officer's mess. These were in a perfect state of, in a perfect state of drill and in their handsome new uniforms had a most imposing appearance. But if their discipline was commendable, their commissariat was beyond all praise. Long lines of carts were to be seen bearing in casks and hampers of the choicest wines, to say nothing of the venison, turkeys, hams, and all other esculents necessary to recruit their strength in the fatigues of war. There can be little doubt that a gourmand would greatly prefer the comfort of dining with a mess of privates of these distinguished corps to the honor and glory of being half starved, of which he ran no small risk, at the table of the governor general himself. Interestingly enough, conspicuously consuming by procuring the latest fashion or a bottle of fine wine would elevate the status of the consumer whether or not they could actually afford to keep up this lifestyle. This was certainly the case in Upper Canada following the war, as Julia Roberts has demonstrated that aspiring gentlemen like Harry Jones often engaged in expensive gentlemanly drinking at the tavern despite being unable to afford it, precisely because this ha helped to establish their identity as privileged gentlemen. The contents of the House of William Firth, who served as Attorney General of Upper Canada in 1807, show just how lavishly some gentlemen of this period lived. Among the many items put up for sale was fine old port and Madeira wines, old Jamaica rum, cognac, brandy, Geneva, whiskey, cider, and scotch ale. He was very well stocked. But military men also spent lavishly. Uh, a statement of loss by Major Givens following the capture of York, for example, shows that he had 30 pounds worth of wine and liquors in the house, which was more than the value of his furniture, groceries, or books, and slightly less than a set of fine silver and ivory handled tableware. So he probably had quite a bit. 
In addition to quality, quantity of consumption could, of course, be conspicuous. The former Major of Artillery Charles James noted that the Horse Guards, one of the most prestigious and aristocratic units of the Army, drank Madeira Port and Claret without limitation. This set gentlemen officers apart from the enlisted men who were restricted in terms of what, when, where, and how much they could drink. The officer who could afford to procure and consume more fine wine than his gentlemanly peers was further elevated. This would have taken on emphasized significance, particularly if a gentleman or officer were able to continue during this during periods of wartime scarcity. In August of 1814, for example, Le Couture was invited to dine with Captain McMillan of the Glengarry Light Infantry, who treated him to port wine, which Le Couture noted was all since expense, oh, sorry, was all expended in the 104th long since. That this man was still able to procure and drink port when none else was to be found and, and even to share it with others certainly left an impression. A letter from Lieutenant General Gordon Drummond to Governor Prevo dated that same month noted that the army was experiencing a most alarming deficiency in everything from flour to spirits, and that he consequently found it necessary to authorize the daily issue of the ration of spirits to the staff officers, who had no greater means in the present state of this division of procuring wine, etc., than the regimental officers. Staff officers, primarily adjutants and administrative types, would have typically had an easier time procuring alcohol because of their supply connections and their position behind the front line. But in this situation, even they were forced to drink the meager rum ration. Rum, gin, whiskey, these were all on the opposite ends of the spectrum from fine wines for men when seeking to construct a gentlemanly identity through conspicuous consumption. Although not emasculating in the same way as claret, these spirits carried distinct lower class connotations. Mass-produced rum was the drink of enlisted soldiers, cheap gin was uh, the drink of the English poor, and home-distilled whiskey was the drink of backwater North American colonials. Perhaps even more important than type of drink, however, was the method in which it was consumed, and how a gentleman or gentleman officer bore its inebriating effects. In the military, as in civilian society, gentlemanliness continued to be constructed through social performance. For gentlemen and gentlemen officers, this performance generally took place behind closed doors. This was intensely homosocial activity where officers established their masculine identity in the eyes of their male peers. This true performance of manliness came after the women departed for the night, and that's when the heavy drinking began. Uh, the heaviest drinking rituals in this time were certainly exclusively male and white. Restricting access asserted the right of privileged white male gentlemen to drink and to drink to excess, and it also concealed their potential drunkenness from the prying eyes of their perceived social inferiors, which would of course undermine claims of social or racial superiority. As Ludding Charles Ludington has shown, for these gentlemen and gentlemen officers, drinking large amounts of alcohol with male companions, and according to the specific rules, was considered to be highly honorable and manly activity up until the end of the Napoleonic Wars. Heavy drinking in the mess was only ever seen as manly, however, if a gentleman or gentleman officer could in tolerate the intoxicating effects of alcohol. Paul Copperman notes that while society might condemn the habitual drunkard, it often lionized the heavy drinkers who seemed to be able to function well. The inveterate 18th century gentleman, Dr. Johnson, for example, boasted that he could drink three bottles of port without being the worse for it. Dr. John Campbell, a, frequently, a frequent attendee at Johnson's Literary Club, bragged that he once drank 13 bottles of port in one sitting. The last man left standing after a night of that type of gentlemanly drinking, who still rose to perform his duty in the morning, of course, would have been regarded as a truly manly, manly figure indeed. Now, while gen well, gentlemanly icons like Dr. Johnson or Campbell may have been able to drink that much wine and find their way home after, not all gentlemen uh, could undertake such a masculine feat. For example, Eli Plater, uh, upper Canadian tavern keeper, tavern keeper turned militia officer, recalled becoming inebriated at a private dinner for five gentlemen and three guests on the 1st of March in 1802. About three o'clock dinner was served up. We spent the evening very pleasant with songs and toast till the wine began to operate. The old gentleman, Mr. Hayward, left us. We were all in fact quite intoxicated. Mr. Hayward, being able to bear more liquor, was capable to see Mr. Boyd home. The wine taking its usual effect on me, I turned very sick and staggered off to bed with Mr. Ward's assistance. He desired me to go into the parlor and take a cup of tea, 
but I knew enough drunk as I was, as I was not to expose myself. And I tumbled into bed where I lay and slept round till morning. We see here that Mr. Hayward's tolerance for alcohol set him apart from other gentlemen. What is perhaps more interesting, however, is that Plater's failure to hold his liquor did not necessarily emasculate him. This is largely because, as he notes, he, was, he, he knew better than to expose himself by being drunk in public. Perhaps he was following yet another piece of Dr. Johnson's sage wisdom regarding drinking. After seeing one of his well-to-do friends drunk at a local tavern, Dr. Johnson cautioned the man that, a man who has been drinking wine at all freely should never go into no new company. With those who have partaken wine with him, he may be pretty well in unison, but he will probably be offensive or appear ridiculous to other people. Johnson went on to explain that drinking may be practiced with great prudence. A man who has exposes himself when he is intoxicated has not the art of getting drunk. A sober man who happens occasionally to get drunk readily enough goes into new company, which a man who has been drinking never should do. Such a man will undertake anything. He is without skill in inebriation. Within the confines of the homosocial gentlemanly dinner party or the officer's mess, a gentleman or gentleman officer's drunkenness was unproblematic. It was treated as a private vice. But when a gentleman's drunkenness was overly public, if he appeared drunk in front of his perceived social inferiors or other gentlemen who were not likewise intoxicated, it was damaging to his character. Habitual and public drunkenness represented a departure from gentlemanly politeness and civility. Elizabeth Foister notes that in early modern England, if a man became so intoxicated that his behaviors became antisocial, then he risked his manhood. Moralists warn that men who were drunk lost their reason and could slip into a bestial state, becoming little different from the brutish swine. Reverend Percival Stockdale, speaking with Dr. Johnson, confirmed as much. I called on Dr. Johnson one morning with, when Miss Williams, the blind lady, was conversing with him. She was telling him where she had dined the day before. There were several gentlemen there, she said, and when some of them came to the tea table, I found that there had been a good deal of hard drinking. She closed this observation with a common and trite moral reflection, which indeed is very ill-founded and does great injustice to animals. I wonder what pleasure men can take in making beasts of themselves. I wonder, madam, replied the doctor, that you have not a penetration to see the strong inducement to the success, for he who makes a beast of himself gets rid of the pain of being a man. Johnson hints that some gentlemen may have turned to drink as an escape from the pressures of conforming to the masculine expectations placed upon them, but if they did so in improper company, their drunkenness would still strip them of that very identity and make them something less than a gentleman, perhaps even less than human. This is because drunkenness in this period has been characterized as a disease of the will. It was thought that general populations, in this context, white British gentlemen and gentlemen officers, were better able to exercise their will as compared to so-called problem subpopulations or simple beasts, which they were compared to. In this context, it was the urban poor and enlisted soldiers, as well as, of course, racialized others, who were constructed as children, unable to exercise their will to overcome baser impulses like the impulse to drink and to drink to excess. Gentlemen, off, gentlemen and gentlemen officers felt that their ability to exercise restraint in all matters set them apart from those who they perceived as their social and racial inferiors. Whether or not this was actually the case in reality, they constructed themselves as tolerant, civilized, and manly, particularly when held up against the image of the drunken Irishman or the drunken Indian, two stereotypes which I explore further in subsequent chapters of my dissertation. But for now, I will conclude by saying that studying the drinking habits of 19th century gentlemen and gentlemen officers can teach us much about constructions of masculinity, class, and race in Canadian history. Thank you for your time. I will now take questions. All right. So I don't see any questions in the q and A. I'll look in the chat. You're welcome to submit them. We'll give people a moment. 
sure thing. Well, I just want to say uh, thank you, Jesse, for that uh, intoxicating presentation. That was Ooh. wonderful. <laughs> I had that fun waiting. <laughs> Good line. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then for anyone who's interested, we do have uh, another Imbibe talk next Thursday. So please join us online at seven o'clock. Um, and then I uh, just want to let everybody know before we go, um, before we start the questions. In September, the museum will be opening up in person. So uh, we will do, be doing our in-person programming. So if all goes well, we'll be uh, ready to go by September. But um, Jesse, it looks like you have some comments and questions. So I'll let you continue. Yeah, we've got a couple coming in here. Um, looking forward to those other talks, by the way. Um, Danielle asks, uh, your presentation was delightful. Was there a previous lecture on the subject? No, I have not spoken on this subject uh, in particular. Uh, nor published anything on it, because this is uh, mostly from chapter two of my dissertation, which is not yet completed. Um, I see another one over here. Curious about the penchant for punches at parties. They were common. Um, there are, I believe Karen Harvey has written a very good article on, on punches um, from a material history perspective. She actually looks at the bowls themselves and talks about um, based on the ingredients that go into them and the porcelain or chinaware bowl that they're made out of, the, the whole ritual of, of having a punch party was almost a way for these, these gentlemen and gentlemen officers to um, imbibe their, their, the entire British Empire and every, every facet of it. All, all the different uh, spices that went into it and the different ingredients came from different parts of the empire. So it was a highly ritualized um, experience and was certainly popular. I don't see it come up as much in um, military accounts of attending parties, but I have seen it in civilian accounts. So, good question. Okay, so if that's all the questions and comments for tonight, um, we'll wrap up. Thank you again, Jesse. That was wonderful. And Thank you to everyone who joined us tonight uh, to hear Jesse, and we hope to see you next Thursday. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night. Bye-bye.